Our guest in this segment, Tim Saya. He is the director of the Day Report Center in Berkeley County. Tim, good morning to you. Good morning. And I want all of our audience to know we checked with Tim on the pronunciation. So I'm not making it up, right? You got it. Yeah. It's pronounced Saya. Saya. Very good, sir. Hey, uh, how long have you been in charge of the Day Report Center as its director? Uh, let's see. It's uh, since, been since August of 2016. August of 2016. Tell me about the growth in the Day Report Center over those nearly seven years. Amazing growth. We uh, We started there with just a couple of employees, myself and... Uh, an office um, assistant and one case manager. There were three of us. Um, we had just a handful of referrals from the probation department, uh, six, six or eight uh, participants. And we've gone from zero to 60 um, really fast. Uh, as of today, there are um, 39 full-time employees at the Day Report Center, four part-timers, and we have over 300 participants on our active roster. So, um, a busy place. Tell me the role that the county council, soon to be called a commission again, played and the prosecuting attorney in the growth in those seven years of the Day Report Center. Well, absolutely significant roles uh, both. I mean, the county council um, at the time decided to, uh, to, to go down this road and they recognize that um, this problem isn't going away and they recognize that we can't incarcerate our way out of the problem. Um, putting uh, people with drug problems in jail because they committed crimes as a direct result of their drug problem not only was very expensive, but it wasn't, it wasn't solving the problem at all. Mm -hmm. The jail bill just continued to rise. Um, uh, in fact, uh, drugs are pretty readily available inside the Eastern Regional Jail. I believe efforts are being made to try and uh, deal with that problem, but uh, people would go to jail and um, They'd use drugs in jail, and there's no treatment offered in, inside the prison. So, um, uh, you know, and they're out of work. They're not paying mm -hmm. taxes. They're not there for their kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Kids are being taken by DHHR. I mean, the, the problems just went on and on and on, and um, very expensive. Um, uh, just to give you a quick idea of the cost, um, you know, uh, f for 300 participants who are uh, incarcerated over the period of one year, um, that cost roughly $5 million two hundred and eighty three thousand three hundred seventy five dollars well we have 300 participants in our program right now who are living in the community they're being drug screened regularly they're reporting to to their substance abuse treatment as as directed and our budget two and a half million so just the day report center alone is saving the county about two and a half million dollars but back to your original question mm -hmm. the council decided to, to to begin the uh, to start this day report center um and it was uh, an absolutely fantastic move and the day report center would not be successful if it were not for the prosecuting attor attorney being supportive of the program um, the judges being supportive of the program I mean the day report center is a community corrections program specifically for people uh, who have gotten into legal trouble as a result of their their drug problem we're not open to the public so we only re accept referrals from the courts from the probation office the parole office um, so people like Katie Delegati and um, the judges, uh, the chief probation officer, uh, uh, Sean Briner, uh, the parole office. It, it takes all these people together to support these efforts. And um, fortunately in our area, all the right people in all the right places support it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been successful. What determines when you get into the system, whether you go to prison or the day report center? Uh, that, that's, that decision is really uh, left to the attorneys uh, involved in the case. Um, they look at each case closely. If, if someone ends up in, in ERJ with a possession charge, they're expecting they're likely someone who may be eligible for, for our program. Um, people with petty larceny charges, they, they stole something to support their habit. Um, you know, they, these folks are looked at individually before they're referred to determine uh, if, if it looks like they're a good candidate. And then when they're referred to our, our program, our case managers look at the case even more closely, um, do a couple of assessments and, and determine their eligibility. Um, they have to have an underlying substance abuse problem to be eligible, and they have to be a nonviolent offender. John. Well, I mean, that's the whole key. I mean, it's, it's not keeping the violent offenders on the street. The violent offenders are locked away, which is what they should be. But the, I mean, it's not just the savings, you know, two and a half, three million dollar savings from the jail bill versus what it costs you guys. It's the fact that they, these people are, are working. These people who have kids, their kids are not having to be taken care of by the foster care system, which is costing the state more. You're not seeing the recidivism 
as much because of that. You're not seeing the relapses. You're not seeing the the pattern going on. You are you're giving these these kids. You're giving the next generation a better chance too. So it's far more. It's far more than the savings to our society is far more than two and a half three million dollars. What do you see as the biggest? Um, the biggest problem that you guys have, what, what do you, what do you need more of to be able to help more people? Well, as it stands at the moment, uh, space, um, we, uh, we started over at the old health department building there at 800 Emmett Roush drive. Um, we outgrew that building pretty quickly. Um, uh, the County, uh, purchased a couple of, of old modular buildings from Clark County school district, set them up beside the old day report center. And uh, we had a little bit more space, but we outgrew them. The county then renovated 520 South Raleigh Street, which is where we're, we're located currently. The old CVS there beside Martin's years ago now sits beside the Sheriff's Department. Um, we expected that building to, to give us a good five years. Well, it, we outgrew it in about a year. So the county is now um, in the process of, of getting a, a renovation or a, an addition uh, project started. Um, we're going to have a three-story addition built onto the front of our building. Um, construction will likely start roughly May or June, um, right around the corner here. Um, so that really, that's we need more staff currently, uh, and we don't have the space for them. Well, I mean, it's, it's great what you guys do, and it's sad that it is expanding so much that the, the drug issues are getting worse and worse as opposed to getting better. What is the what is the fallout rate of people who come into your program who end up end up dropping out? I mean, out of out of th- out of three hundred people, how many would you expect will not make it through? One hundred and fifty. Okay. Rough, roughly fifty percent of all new referrals result in a discharge from our program within thirty days, simply because they just they just don't report. And uh, that's Does that re- send them back to prison. Correct. And and that's that really uh, is just part of the insanity of addiction. Um, in spite of the fact that these folks know that that incarceration awaits them, uh, the the addiction that they're suffering from is is powerful, and um, even a consequence like that isn't quite enough yet to get them to adhere. Um, so roughly 50% of all new referrals result in a discharge within 30 days. Can you go through the process? Somebody is referred to your program. What is the what is the process? What's the the standard operating procedure of what they go through? Yep. So, for instance, if uh, if someone who's on probation supervision uh, has a, a test positive for a substance, their probation officer will send us a referral. Uh, our case management staff will contact them and have an intake appointment scheduled within usually within forty eight hours. Uh, they come into the day report center. They meet with uh, with a case manager and. There's about a it's about a two hour um, intake assessment uh, that takes place. There's a, an assessment tool we we use called Level of Services Case Management Inventory, and we look at we look at their their history, their their substance use history, their um, their criminal history, their family history, their employment history. We look at all these factors and and um, establish a treatment plan that is best suited for that individual. We want to meet meet the needs that that they have um, as an individual. Uh, and everyone's a little bit different. Um, for the people that are referred to our program that are actively using heroin or, or fentanyl, the large majority of them, they can't stop using that drug on their own. They need to go into an inpatient facility. So our case management staff makes arrangements for them to get into a detox program uh, that can be anywhere from you know five to, to 10 days. And then ideally, um, if beds are available, we transition them straight from detox into an inpatient treatment facility for at least 28 days, ideally longer, uh, but frequently insurance and and such doesn't allow for that. So um, Mountaineer Recovery Center has been a blessing to our population. It's right here. um, And nine times out of 10, we can get we can get our our participants into Mountaineer Recovery Center for a 28 day stay. And they do their best to extend that stay to, uh, you know, two and three months. The longer a person is in an inpatient treatment center who's been using heroin and fentanyl for a number of years, the better the outcome. It really does take a a significant period of time uh, for their brains and their bodies to heal um, from the, the, uh, I don't know what the word is, from the damage that's been caused to their their brains. They need to learn and their brains need to learn how to to live uh, without that substance and begin to enjoy life again. 
because for a period of time, I mean, post-acute withdrawal syndrome can last up to a year. And, and even though a person may not be physically ill from, from withdrawal any longer, they feel like they can't enjoy things that they used to enjoy. Um, you know, for the person that used to enjoy hanging out on a Friday night and watching a movie with their family or friends or going out to eat or going fishing or going for a hike. Those, those are things that many people enjoy, right? The average heroin addict, after a period of time of, of using this drug, they don't enjoy those things anymore. They can't. The only, the only way that they can enjoy anything is with that substance feeding their brain and, and altering their brain the way that it had. And it takes, it takes time to heal from that. Um, a lot of people that relapse, they relapse simply because they feel depressed. They feel unhappy, um, and they convince themselves that the only way they'll be able to feel happiness or joy or peace again is by using that substance, and it leads them back. Um, so it takes time. So, so back to your original question. Sometimes inpatients stay, and then when they're transitioned back into our program, we're an outpatient program, and we offer a variety of, 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 of treatment groups there at the Day Report Center. We have intensive outpatient programs, which are facilitated by master's level therapists. Um, and that is uh, three hours a day, three days a week of group therapy and one hour a week of individual therapy. Um, and then we'll also treatment plan them to some other groups that, that may be appropriate for them. We have parenting groups. We have life skills groups. We have nutrition groups. Uh, we have peer recovery groups, um, cognitive behavioral interventions for substance abuse groups. I could go on and on. We, we're we actually running about 83 hours uh, of group a week um, at the Day Report Center. So we try to we try to meet each person exactly where they need to be met and, and um, you know, um, help them whatever way we can. I mean, some people need help with, with basic things in the community. They need help with, with housing and uh, getting plugged in with insurance. They need some food assistance. You know, we we want to we want to set them up for success um, and get them back on their feet and living on their own in the community. Matt Miller, when you're working with uh, a, an individual who is going through this, how much work is also going on with, say, a family? If this person has a spouse and children, uh, is there support for them through this process as well? Yes, addiction is very much a, a, a family disease. It doesn't just affect one person; it affects affects them all. Um, we have a uh, our, our juvenile program is called Catalyst. Uh, Catalyst is a uh, is a mouthful. It's, it's actually just been over the last couple of years. The Day Report Center uh, was started for, as an adult program. Um, we recognize the need for this uh, for this sort of uh, treatment for the juveniles in our community. They're they're really isn't a whole lot for juveniles who, who are affected by this problem. So the Catalyst Program, which stands for Community-Based Assessment and Treatment for Adolescents and Families to Launch Interventions for Substance and Trauma. That's a mouthful, but um, uh, we actually have a family therapist uh, as part of the Catalyst staff. And um, when juveniles are referred to our program, and our juvenile program is actually growing faster than our adult program currently. Um, there's about 50 kids currently enrolled. Um, but uh, it's not just for the juveniles who are affected, it's for their families as well. So we have a family therapist on staff who's available to, uh, to do group and individual therapy for, for parents and caregivers. Um, uh, there's also a, a family support group offered at the Recovery Resource Center, which is for family members who have lost a loved one f to an overdose. Um, so there's, there's a variety of supports there for families. Do you find a lot of times that if, if it is a drug issue within a home that it impacts not just, say, the father, but, but mom may be involved as well and, and, and how that dynamic plays out, or does it tend to be just one within the family? It, 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 any of the above. Any, yeah. um, I mean, if, if sometimes a, a spouse or uh, the parent of a child or the child of a parent who's, who's suffering from addiction – they just don't understand. Um, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to how to best uh, deal with their loved one, um, and they they just need some education. I mean, for the average person that's never experienced addiction, and begins to see someone that they love be affected by it, it's confusing. Uh, it's hurtful. They they don't know how to handle it. Um, a lot of parents of people with with addiction problems end up enabling over a long period of time because they think they're helping. When in fact they're actually, you know, doing more harm uh, by enabling, providing 
financial assistance to their loved one, mm-hmm. bailing them out of jail if, if they get arrested, um, housing them, uh, driving them places, getting giving them, I mean, all sorts of things that parents will do for their child um, because they love them and they care for them and they want what's best for them. They're actually enabling the addiction. Tim yeah, so. Saya is our guest here. He is the uh, person who runs the Day Report Center in uh, Berkeley County. Tim, of the people that we see at the Day Report Center, how many of them, if you know, uh, began their addictions with a legal physician prescribed prescription? So that's actually something that I've paid close attention to over a period of a, a couple of years. Um, I think there's a, a, a pretty significant misconception that uh, a lot of people out there who were not people who had any kind of addiction problems um, got injured in a car accident or something like that were were given a prescription for oxycodone or oxycotton and then turned into a heroin addict. Um, what I've learned is that uh, there are very few people that fall into that category. Um, the large majority of people that enter into our program, they may very well have had a prescription at some point in time, um, but uh, they were already had addiction problems. They were people who were, you know, lived the party life. They, they smoked weed. They, they drank excessively on a regular basis. Um, they experimented with other drugs, and then they, they tried a prescription pain medication, and they liked it, and it ended up resulting in a heroin addiction. But... Um, there's very few people who did not have pre-existing addiction problems who ended up an addict because of one of those prescriptions. That's an interesting bit of information you just gave us because we are led to believe the opposite. Yes, it is true. The pharmaceutical companies overproduced and overprescribed uh, oxycotton and oxycodone for a number of years. Um, it's an addict- addictive, highly addictive pain medications. Um, they got their hands smacked. I mean, a number of these companies are involved in serious lawsuits at the moment. Um, and what they are doing now is they're, in my opinion, overproducing and overprescribing Suboxone, which is meant to treat addiction. Well, it itself is an addictive medication. Um, people who use Suboxone, a safer alternative than heroin, there's no questioning that. Um, but they're addicted to the drug and their life revolves around it just like it did uh, the other drug. Um, it can be done legally, but those who are, who are on that, that medication, um, you know, that the pharmaceutical companies want them to stay on that medication long term. Uh, what I would like to see is for that medication to be used as I believe it was originally designed to be used, and that is to get a person through the, the first year or maybe two years post uh, uh, illegal drug addiction and then move on to, to life without that medication and yeah, be you- free from it. You're not going to see McDonald's wean people off the fries. That's, that's, that's correct. where they make the money. <laughs> you are correct. Yep. Do you deal specifically with drug addiction or is alcohol involved at all? Do you deal with any alcohol addiction? Yes. Alcohol, ju- a, a drug, it's just the same yep. thing. Same. Okay. Yeah. That's... There are uh, most of the, the, the people that we have uh, under home confinement supervision are there as a result of um, DUIs and driving mm-hmm. revoked for a DUI and things of that nature. So a lot of our participants, yes, alcohol is their drug of choice. Uh, it was a problem for them. It led to legal involvement. And mm-hmm. we treat them the same as we do a person with a, an illegal drug problem. So for someone who is in the program, you mentioned all of the various um, things that they have available to them uh, to be able to help them. They're still hopefully able to get up in the morning, go to work, you do the things that they need to do to provide for themselves and their family and then uh, be at the report center for the various times that they're able to get that counseling and that support and and kind of get back if you will to life as normal yes we have um, when the day report center first started back in 16 uh, we were only open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. we realize that there are a number of people that, that work during the day, uh, weren't able to attend uh, treatment, which they need to be involved in. So we have extended hours of operation. We're open Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday 8 to 5, and Saturday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we've done our best to accommodate uh, work schedules for, for folks. We want them to work. Um, mm-hmm. That's a huge part of their, their recovery process is getting back into the workforce and providing for their families and, and paying their bills and taking care of themselves. So we support that. We want them to work. And um, 
uh, we, we'll do everything that we can to accommodate work schedules. Yeah, how much does that help them maybe to get that job? Because I'm sure there are a lot of employers who might look at someone's history and go, I don't know if I want to hire them or not. But knowing that they're part of the Day Report Center, they're making an effort to see a change in their life. That's got to help. It does. It does. Uh, if, if, if employers know that they're involved in community supervision and they're being regularly mm-hmm. drug screened and they're attending uh, treatment, that's a, that's a plus for them. They appreciate mm-hmm. that. Do you work with local faith-based communities as well? Is there a faith element to the things that you do? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I bet my, my personal story, um, I'm in recovery myself. I was a heroin act when I was young. And um, if it were not for uh, a program called Teen Challenge, which is mm-hmm. a long-term faith-based program. Are you familiar? I am, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a product of Teen Challenge. All right. um, I, I tried uh, – there are a variety of pathways to recovery, and um, different things work for different people. For me – um, faith in Christ and being uh, reintegrated into what I was originally taught as a child um, was uh, was what changed my heart and, and changed my life, and uh, it's how I found freedom from addiction. Mm-hmm. So um, there are different churches around that uh, that have uh, a program called Celebrate Recovery uh, that they hold at their church. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name. The the church off of uh, Tabler Station Road there. New Life. New Life has yeah. a has a pretty large Celebrate Recovery group uh, that meets. Um, so yes, answer your questions. Right. Yes, Tim Sia, thanks so much for the visit. I think we all learned a lot. Keep up the great work that you're doing in the community. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I hope we can have you back again. Sure. Uh, Delegate uh, John Hardy, who's the vice chair of finance, sent me a text that said the legislature has got to do a. I will just read it. The legislature must act to make circuit judges recognize these drug courts and day report centers as legal alternative programs. Some counties will not use these or recognize them as a legal alternative. So maybe we can talk more about uh, that with John Hardy coming up later this week.